So let me just summarize what we did last time. Hold on, let me move this over so I can see if there's any comments. On the right side here. So last time we talked about this force we're going to be starting the, the, uh, this course with, the fo a force that exists in nature called the electrostatic force. And basically the, the electrostatic force uh, is carried by two particles, atomic particles, the electron and the proton. Uh, the electron, it, basically the, the essence of the force is the electron because it's, it's the particle that's transferred from one place to the other. But the other particle that carries the ability to exert forces on charges is the proton itself. So the proton and the electron are the carriers of the charge. The electron is negatively charged and the, in the, and the proton is positively charged. They both have the same charge though, however. Now, because the, the protons are found in the nucleus, the, the protons are not in, removed very easily. It's kind of hard to remove them. But the electrons can remove, in fact, the electrons move around in, in uh, material. The, all the atoms that comprise the material, the electrons move around in that material. And they can be moved off the material even through by rubbing, by friction. And we saw that when that happens, the object that you're rubbing is um, charged. It has the ability to exert forces on other charges. So that's where we left off last time. And so let me now, so today what we're gonna do is we're gonna look at how we describe this force mathematically. So this was done by Coulomb in the late 1700s. We actually was able to measure using Newton's, measure the charge between the, the force between two charged objects. And he found, by doing many experiments, he found a couple of things about it. First of all, that the force gets weaker if you take the, the subjects further apart. If you make R bigger, the force gets weaker, but it gets weaker very rapidly. It drops off as one over distance squared, just like force of gravity. And of course, the other thing about it is you double one, any one of the charges, you double the force. If you double both the, char both the charges, you quadruple the force. And so this tells you that the force is proportional to the product of the two charges. We call one Q1 and one Q2. So the symbol for, um, for charge is Q usually. We use Q and the carrier of the charge, of electric charge is the electron. It has a very tiny amount of charge. The units are called coulombs. So in 1870s, charge, uh, Charles Coulomb showed that the electric force is given by this equation, these proportionalities over here. What does it mean proportional? Well, that means if we want to have an equal sign here, this gonna, this gonna, a constant will appear in front here. And this constant is called the Coulomb constant. It's spelled with a K. Uh, so this replaces the fact that these are depends on this. If you want, the, the Coulomb constant basically uses units uh, to come up with uh, units of force for uh, Newtons, like in this case, for force. And uh, the Coulomb constant is very tiny. You're going to see it in the next slide. But uh, in any case, the uh, charge, the amount of charge is, is measured in, in Coulombs, units called Coulombs. One electron has 1.6 times 10 to the minus 19 Coulombs, which is a very small amount of Coulombs on one electron. One Coulomb would require this many electrons. So we saw all this in the last time. So Coulomb's law is written this way, and the, the constant here, how do you measure this constant? Basically, you have to measure everything else here, except K, and that basically gives you the constant. So this is the value of the Coulomb constant. 
usually we just use nine here, nine times 10 to the ninth. Uh, so these are the constants. Uh, this is the Coulomb constant. If you recall from last semester, we also had a very similar equation that looked like this one. It's the force of gravity over here, Newton's law of universal gravitation. And that had the same type of structure, except the constant was different. In fact, this constant is much smaller than this constant. The Coulomb constant is a pretty big number, by 9 times 10 to the ninth, but the gravitational constant was 6.67 times 10 to the minus 11. These are the units for that constant, Newton meter squared per Coulomb squared. That means and you get the units by solving this equation for K, and you get F times R squared over Q1 times Q2. So F is Newton's, R squared is going to be meter squared, and Q1 times Q2 will be Coulomb squared. That's why that's how you get these units. So we'll, we'll do a couple of examples a little bit later of using that for the formula. But uh, sometimes you write it this way over here. Uh, and what this means is it's equal to the magnitude of Q1 times the magnitude of Q2 divided by the distance between them squared. Now, the direction, of course, of the force, the force is a vector, has direction. So right now, the, the direction of the force between two point charges is either toward, toward each other or away from each other. Now, th these don't have to be point charges. They could be a charged object that have charges on them and they're some distance apart. So Q1 is the absolute value of the net charge on one object, and Q2 is the absolute value of the net charge on the other object. And R12 is the distance between them. And of course, it, has, it tells you here to note the striking similarity to Newton's law of gravity, which you see over here. Uh, Newton's law of gravity is this value in these in these uh, units associated with it, very similar to this here. The units are almost the same, right? Instead of kilogram, we have coulombs squared on the bottom here for the units. But this for this number is much bigger than that number, which means the, elect the electric force is much more powerful. It's about 10 to the 24 times bigger than the gravitational force. And we're going to look, see how that comes about the 10 to the 24 a little bit later. So this is another statement of Coulomb's law. Now, sometimes this will be, you'll see it written a little bit differently. Instead of using this constant, in this case, they use K sub E for the electrostatic force. Instead of using this constant, they let that, this constant can be replaced by a different constant. One over four pi times epsilon naught. Where, what are these things? Well, you know what F pi is, right? But it, it, you'll see later why this turns out to be sometimes to use this as the constant in front of the formula here. Uh, okay, so you can uh, see you replace K with 1 over 4, or 4 pi epsilon naught, and the Coulomb's law then looks like this. Now, this what does this R mean? This R means it's the, along the line of action between the two charges. Okay, so that means if there one's here and one's down here, it will be the line of action between them, which will be that line. That's the R. 
what is epsilon naught? Well, it's called the permeability of free space, epsilon naught, which is something that appears in the fellow who who described all these forces mathematically, uh, Maxwell. So it, it appears in Maxwell's equations, and this is where it comes from. So let's do a simple example, use, use the formula. Okay, what is the magnitude of the electric force between two protons five meters apart? So this is a proton, pro, this is another proton, this is five meters. So the formula is over here, you can use the Coulomb constant times Q1 times Q2. Don't forget Q1, each of these things is a proton, so it has a charge of E. 1.6 times 10 to the minus 19. So we can write this as make calculations a little simpler. K E squared divided by R squared, which in this case would be 5 squared. And again, using the Coulomb constant over here, putting in for Coulomb constant, we get 8.99 times 10 to the 9th times 1.6 times 10 to the minus 19. That's E, the charge of an electron, and a proton, by the way, squared, divided by 5 squared. And you can see the units will come out to be Newtons. 9.2 times 10 to the minus 30. 10 to the minus 30, it's a tiny, tiny number. But don't forget, you're talking about just one, two protons, right? Or well, you could be talking about two electrons that would have the same force between them. Or it could be the proton and an electron. It would have the same force between them except a different direction. So just summarizing that formula one more time. Again, this is the way you write it. K is called the Coulomb constant. It's equal to this number. Q1 and Q2 are the two charges. The charge on the two two uh, uh, objects over here, and F is the force between the charges. It could be a, a repulsive or attractive force, and R is the distance between them squared. So, a couple of more pictures here. So if the charges are like this. That force will be repulsive along this direction. That's what this R means. It's along the the line of the uh, action between them. If they're opposite charges, then the force will be this way. This is still R. So unlike charges attract, like charges repel. Even if they're, they're in, they could be negative charges, two negative charges, like charges, and they still will repel. So let's look a couple of couple of problems. Uh, these problems, uh, we're, we're doing problems that are uh, conceptual in nature. So which of the following is the correct force between two positive charges? No calculations required here. I see people, I see a little ping. I know some people are answering the questions. Then I'll look at, see how they answer. So two positive charges repel. So which one of these would be the correct diagram? It would be, yes, yeah, C would be the correct diagram for this one. I got another one for you. It's not any harder, but still is it. How about two negative charges? Which would be the correct answer? Which of the following is the correct force between two negative charges? Okay, so they repel, and the line of action, the forces are along the line of action, so they'll be in this line. That's what the R in the formula meant, the little R vector like this. So C, again, is the same right answer. There's one, one more question here. 
which of the following is the correct force between one positive and one negative charge? Let's also see, right? They repel one another. Uh, oh, one positive, one negative. You know, they attract one another. Is not C. One positive and one negative charge. That's over here. It's D. Sorry about that. D, right? I'm still in the previous problem. Okay. So this is a uh, just an exercise in actually using the formula. We did that one, one exercise. So it, uh, let's sort of set this one up at least. We have a 20 microcoulomb point charge is located 20 centimeters away from, from a minus 40 coulomb char, uh, microcoulomb charge. Microcoulomb, microcoulomb. What is the force on each charge due to the other? So you have a positive charge of 20 microcoulombs and, and a negative charge, let me do it in different color, of 40 microcoulombs, I put it in minus 40 microcoulombs. And they are 20 centimeters away or 0.2 meters. You got to use distance in meters because this is the uh, Coulomb constant is in meters. So obviously this is a lot of calculations. You could at least set it up, write the equation just to make sure you understand what's happening. And by, by the calculations over here, okay, K times Q1, Q2, 9 times 10 to the 9, which is K, 20 times 10 to the minus 6. Don't forget what a microcoulomb is. It's 10 to the minus 6. And this is minus 40 times 10 to the minus 6 divided by 0.2 now. I put down point 0.1 here. It's 0.2 meters. 20 centimeters. 0.2 meters. And you do all that multiplication. You find it's 1.8 times 10 squared, 10 to the second power, towards each other because these are these are opposite charges. The force will be toward each other. So this here, you see, the, the force is much bigger because we're not talking about a proton and an electron. We're talking about many protons. 20 microcoulombs is still 10 to the minus 6 coulombs, but it, that's a lot of electrons or protons, okay, to have that many coulombs. And so this force now comes out fairly large. It's 180 newtons. So this would be the right answer this time. So let's look at what happens when you join two things that are uh, have different charges on them. What happens when you let them touch? Okay, so let's take a look at, let's say we have these two spheres. One is charged negatively, minus 4E, and one is not charged at all, it's neutral. So supposing you bring these close, but you don't, you don't let it touch yet, okay? So when you bring it close, what happens is that, well, this is a negative charge. All the negative charges will repel. They'll go to, let me do this in red. They'll go to the other side. And the positive charges will be attracted to this side. But it's still, neutral this thing is still the net charge on it this is what happens but the net charge on it is still zero now what happens if the spheres touch well what happens is 
the electrons push as far apart as they can because like charges repel. And the charge distributes it, itself. It jumps across. The extra charge will jump across. And such, the electrons will jump across. Don't forget, the protons don't do any jumping. But the electrons will jump across so that both both have acquired the same charge. So what? So how many uh, how many coulombs have to have to? Or many, uh, we're talking about electrons here. Four emis, four electrons more. So how many electrons have to jump across from here to here for the charge to be the same on both? Don't forget, this is zero initially, and this is four e. Well, two of them will have to jump, have to jump across, right? Two electrons will have to jump across. So this now will have a, a charge of minus two, and this will have a charge of minus two if you separate them after that. You touch them and then separate them, you will see that they have the, the same charge. The electrons jumped across. But what if So generally speaking, well, generally speaking, the charge could be Q, it could be a big number, you know. We don't know how much Q is or not. Let's say it's Q. And this is this is minus Q and this is plus Q. So what happens if you let them touch? Well, the, the, these charges are going to jump in such a way that both acquire uh, the same charge. And what would be the same charge? Well, in this case, if if one of them jumps across, If, if Q jumps across over here, this will be right. This will be minus. This will be minus two Q. Okay, so if, if Q jumps across, this will, this will become minus two Q now. I'm sorry. This will become. This will become neutral. Okay. So, but this will still be, this will be neutral. In other words, it has no charge. And this will be, what, if you uh, add Q, minus Q here, this becomes Q then. It's still not the same. So what happens, this Q now will have to be distributed equally. Don't forget, this is not electrons, so there could be very large numbers. This Q will not be distributed equally. So what would happen then? That means half of it, half the charges would go over here. Okay, so both of them will have half. They started like this, you, you let them touch, they ended up like this. And you can see by doing it one by one, how did, how did the negative charges transfer from here to here and what happens to the charges? So we're gonna do a problem like that in a, in a minute here. As soon as I find my place in the notes. Yeah, okay. <clears throat> So again, Q jumps, minus Q comes from here to here. This becomes neutral, but this becomes plus Q. Uh, but they have to be the same. So half of the of, of the charge here will go back here. And you'll have minus Q and, and minus Q in each one here. <clears throat> so let's do a problem. Let me see. Anybody any questions? All right, so this is sort of similar to what we've been doing. Let's say we have the charges here between these two spheres is minus 3Q and here is plus Q. Two identical spheres, one is plus Q and the other one is minus Q separated by distance R. The opposite charges, there'll be an attractive force between the spheres. The two spheres are brought in brief contact and then moved apart. If the new electrostatic force between the spheres is F prime, which of the following is true? Okay, so you have to keep in mind what's going to happen is that uh, to calculate what F prime is between these two spheres, 
you need to know what how, how much charge is here and how much charge is here. So let's start off here. Right over here, the force between them is is what? Let's calculate it. KQ, that's this charge, times this charge, minus 3Q. Divided by R squared. So to just write it down, it's minus K Q squared over R squared. This is what it is here. Now, if they come in contact, they have to redistribute. These negative charges have to be redistributed equally. So these two have the same charge. So how is that going to happen? Well, how are these distributed? If you take one Q from here and put it here, this becomes neutral and this becomes 2Q, right? I'm going to take one Q out. They're still not the same. I got to take another Q out. So I take another Q out, put it here. This now becomes minus Q and this one is also minus Q. Uh huh. So that's what happens. All right. So this is minus q and this is minus q so that's my hint see if you guys can answer this question now So you know this is this is the force here. Just calculate it here. Call this F prime and see how is this related to this? Okay. How is the force here related to the one you're gonna calculate here? Let me get you started on this. This is pretty simple because it's Q K times Q times this q, which is q squared, divided by, the distance stays the same, r squared. So, I, I forgot a three here, that's what's confusing. I forgot the three, the three over here. Somebody tell me if I make a mistake, please. Yeah, k times q times minus three q gives you three kq squared over r squared. So now, how does this compare to that? Which one of these choices? First of all, is this, is F bigger than F prime? Yes. Let's look at it another way. Is F prime smaller than F? Yes. By how much is it smaller? Look at these choices. We know this is wrong. We know this is wrong. F prime is smaller than F. So we know this is wrong. So it's either this answer or that answer. Which one is it? I know I confused you when I made this mistake. I know. Sorry about that. Yeah, C is the right answer. That this is one third of that. Multiply this by one third, you get that, right? And I, I know I confused you and I forgot the three over here. So I guess, well, I don't think I have another problem to do right now. So what we're going to do is we're going to we're going to compare the two forces the electrostatic force and the force of gravity okay so in in terms of uh, strength 
And so the way we're going to do it is this way. We're going to take two electrons. Two electrons. We're going to find the force of gravity between them. Force of true gravity is attractive. And then we're going to find the for electrostatic force using the equation, Coulomb's law. And that's a repulsive force. Yes. But what we're interested in is the magnitude of the, how big is this compared to that? All right. So we got to calculate each one. Now, to do that, to calculate the, the gravitational force, we need to know the mass. Here's the mass of an electron. To calculate the electrostatic force, we need to know the charge. This is the charge on, on an electron. All right, so the charge of an electron, we call it E, is going to be equal to that. K is this number. Gravitational constant, you're going to need gravitational constant is equal to that number. And so now what you're going to do is you're going to write Coulomb's law. Don't forget that the two electrons, so Q1 times Q2 is just E squared over R squared. And this is the same distance for the gravitational force is going to be G m squared because each one has a mass of m over r squared so now we're going to divide one by the other so basically what we're going to do this we're going to calculate uh, we're going to calculate uh, f e so i thought i had this set up this divided by that so if you divide this, divide by that, a couple of things will cancel here. R squares will cancel. So all you're going to have is K E squared divided by G M squared. All right. So this is going to be F E divided by F G, which is tells you the ratio of these two forces. So let's here they are over here and it turns out and i'm going to show you a little bit of the calculations it's about 10 it's about oops it's about 10 to the 36 power if you put in all the numbers over here the mass the charge e the mass over here it's about 10 to the, to the 36 and i think i have no, I don't have the calculations here. Anyway, this, it is tremendously more powerful. So, for example, if I have two two balls, two baseballs, I can't show you one baseball picking up the other one. The force is too weak. It won't do it. One of those balls has to be like the size of a planet. But if I showed you a charged object picks up paper. You saw, you saw a little demonstration of that. It can pick up paper. And if you haven't seen it, well, I'll do it in class the next time we meet. Okay, maybe we should do one, just one more example of just using the formula. What is it? Well, this this is not just one more example. So this one uses the formula to solve for one of these variables, not F. In this case, what is the distance between two charges of 7.8 microcoulombs and 9.2 microcoulombs if they exert a force of 4.5 millinewtons on each other? So basically, they want you to solve for this. So if you solve for this, multiply both sides by R squared. All right, and then divide by kq uh, and you get f r squared divided by kq uh, r squared equals uh, i messed this up let me just put put it over here here it is <clears throat> I try to move these around here. Anyway, you multiply both sides by R squared, then divide by KQ1, Q2. Uh, and I'm sorry, uh, you multiply both sides by R12 squared.
and then divide both sides by F, and you get this. And you put in the numbers. Again, K is 9 times 10 to the 9th. Q1 is 7.8 times 10 to the minus 6. Q2 is 9.2 times 10 to the minus 6 divided by that. I know this is a lot of calculations. That's why I'm not asking you to do it right now. But it could be done, you know, without any major difficulty. You get 12 meters on this. Don't forget the force is 4.5 milli newtons, milli. This is uh, milli meters. Uh, I'm sorry, the distance is, in, yeah, in, in meters. Forces in newtons. Milli, not M, but in milli newtons. This is the mistake they made here. Milli newtons, which is 10 to the minus 3 newtons. And they didn't make a mistake. They changed it already to, uh, to milli newtons. To newtons, rather. I'm sorry. This is supposed to be newtons now. 4.5 milli newtons is 4 times 10 to the minus 3 newtons. Okay. <clears throat> Whoever made this slide made a mistake here. So uh, other problems where you use that formula to solve for something else. So for example here, similar type of problem, but you charge, what is the magnitude of the second charge? In other words, you want to solve this for Q2. So multiply both sides by R squared, you get FR squared. This time I'm putting in the steps so as not to confuse you or make a mistake. Q1 times Q2. Right, multiply sides, both sides by R squared. And this side too. And then uh, solve, solve this for Q2. So Q2. Will equal to FR squared times KQ one. All right, so again, I'm not going to put in the numbers here, but I'm going to show you the numbers once they're put in. So you can see it over here in the bottom. So here's the equation that I have a, oops, let me put it over here. I have the same equation over here. Putting it for F, what it's given here. Uh, 1.8 times 10 to the minus three Newtons over here. 1.8 times 10 to the minus three Newtons times r squared 2.4 the distance between them is 2.4 times k times the other charge q1 and you get q2 is 2.7 times 10 to the minus 7 coulombs i just want to check yeah i am recording okay all right, so this is just one more in this, in this case. Well, this is a little bit different. No, it isn't the same. Uh, it basically asks about electrons. Okay, so basically you have to charge you have to solve for Q, for one of these Qs. And uh, two equals, so this is going to be Q squared, two equal negatively charged, two equal negatively charged. So this could be written as F is equal to KQ squared, right? Because Q1 and Q2 are the same, so K2 squared divided by R squared. 
and solve for Q, first of all, and then you can figure out how many electrons will add up to that Q. So let's just, just solve this for, for, for Q. So if you solve for Q squared, right, if you solve for Q squared, this equation, you get FR squared, over k. But that's not the answer yet, because this will give you the total amount of charge, not how many electrons. Uh, let me just peek at what, 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 the, what q is. OK, 1.7 times 10 to the minus 7. I'll, I'll show you the calculation in a second. 1.7 times 10 to the minus 7 coulombs. Uh, Q, yeah, Q squared equals this, but, but this is the square root of that, and you get Q is equal to 1.7 times 10 to the minus 7 coulombs. This will give you Q squared, and uh, I can, right, Q is the square root of this. So if you solve this for Q, you get the square root of that. And the Q here is gone. When you put in all the numbers, take the square root, you get this. So the important part here that's different from the, e, from the previous problem is how many electrons is that? Well, you know this is going to equal to the number of electrons times the charge of each electron, which is 1.6 times 10 to the minus 19. So you don't have to remember these things, like the charge of an electron, but you should be able to look them up. And Q is 1 point, so now you're going to, N is going to equal to, the, which is the answer they're asking for. How many electrons is that? 1.7 times 10 to the minus 7th divided by 1.6 times 10 to the minus 19th. And I'll show you the calculations right here. So right here are the calculations. Number of electrons is 1.27. Oh, this comes out to 27. I'm sorry. Yeah, 27. 27. So this is 1.27. And you get 7.9 times 10 to the 11th electrons. So 7.9 B is the right answer over here. <clears throat> I'm sorry, but I'm not doing good today, right? This is the second mistake I've made. Uh, 1.27, I, I just had, I copied it from here. I just didn't put in the right answer. Anyway, so you can see the summary of everything I did, right? You start off with this, K, Q, and Q are the same, so this is this Q squared. You solve this equation for this Q. So Q is equal to the square root of FR squared over K. You put in the numbers for the, given in this problem. The force is 18 millinewtons. K is 9 point, uh, it's not K, this is, the distance between them is 9 centimeters, 9 centimeters, which is uh, 9 times 10 to the minus 2 meters. Don't forget, it's got to be in meters. And K is, this is why these have to be newtons and meters, because of what k is in these units.
and the number of electrons equals that number. Okay, let's So we already talked about conductors, so we don't need to do that. Okay. A conducting sphere is charged with a negative charge minus Q. Which statement about the charge distribution is correct? So what happens if you have a conducting sphere like made out of metal, like a metal ball, and you put charge on it, what happens? Well, basically, uh, I should show you a little film about that, you know. So let's do it. So, um, we're going to watch the whole film before, but right now, uh, a little bit later, but right now I just want to show you that little demonstration. Well, that's sort of uh, simulation, not simulation. If a positive charge is brought near a metal, it attracts the mobile, negatively charged electrons toward itself, causing them to pile up at the nearest surface. The result is to leave net positive ions unbalanced by electrons at the far surface. The closer an electric charge gets to a metal, the more charge of the opposite sign builds up on the near surface, and more charge of the same sign is left on the rest of the surface. And now an amazing little box. Okay, I'm going to show this one a little bit later. So basically when you touch it, the charge is evenly distributed in the surface of the sphere. It spreads out all on the sphere if you touch it. I guess he didn't do that. I thought he was going to do that there, but he's going to do that a bit later. And we saw already in this film, I'm not going to watch it again, that if you bring these two together, well, maybe we should watch it. Because maybe it means a little bit more now. We'll uh, close that for the time being. So if you bring this closer, All right, let's do it one more time. So I can move this so you guys can see what's happening. So you bring it, this is charged body. You bring it close. What happens is that just before that, all the, all the negative charges go this way, all the positive charges go here. But when you touch it, the negative charges flow from here to there. And now this is negatively charged. And this is negatively charged. So they repel one another. So when a charged object is placed in contact with another object, some electrons on the rod move to the sphere. When the rod is removed, the sphere is left with a charge, and you saw that happen there. The object charged is always left with a charge having the same sign as the object doing the charging. In other words, now, this will now be negatively charged. Because some of the negative charge, it was neutral to start with, right? Now some of the negative charges float in here. So it's got more negative than positive. So it, 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 the charge is always left with, it, with the charge having the same sign as the object that did the charging, which was this rod here. Okay, I showed you a little part of the other film here. I'm going to show you the rest of it in a second. But let's 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 look at this here. So this is more or less what we were, we were talking about before. This is a rod, and this is a, a body that has positive charges. So a positively charged sphere is brought near the end A of the uncharged metal box. Don't forget, this is neutral. 
ends A and B, when, when, when this gets closed, ends A and B of the middle bar will be charged how? This end versus that end. Based on what you just saw in that film. Well, this positive charge, this uh, positive charge here was going to attract all the negative charges. Don't forget, this this starts off with the same amount of negative and positive charges. But the negative charges are going to go here because this is positive. The positive charge is going to be repelled by that ball and they're going to go here. So, A is positive, uh, A is negative. B is positive. A is negative. B is positive. This would be the right answer. How'd you guys do? All right. Let's look at a, a, a couple of other demonstrations here. So this is one way to charge something charging by induction. So you bring something here, you don't touch it, but now you touch it with your hand. So you don't touch it here, so nothing from here goes here, but you do touch it with your hand. And basically the negative charges, this is called grounding. The, the negative charges fall through your finger into the planet Earth. Okay, let's do, watch it again. This is still neutral. But now your hand comes in here and now this is called grounding. You, you, the negative charges go into the, the earth itself, into the ground of the earth. And now this is positively charged because you removed some of the negative charges. This is called charging by induction. Let's take a look, and, and I usually do this demonstration in class, but I, I'm going to show it to you, I guess, on a, on a film. This electroscope, okay? An electroscope consists of a metal here, so it conducts electricity, and two metal strips, metal being very light strips, very light uh, strips of gold. And this is, an, uh, this is called an electroscope. It determines what it, something we're going to study next uh, a little bit later in this chapter there's an electric field around so we're going to look at uh, a little demonstration of that i thought i had the demonstration set up here but i guess not but i have it already set up on So he's going to do this demonstration here. Thank you, These properties are used in an instrument of science that may seem like magic. It's called a gold leaf electroscope. Watch closely. When an electric charge is brought near the metal disc, the gold leaf moves away from the rod. Load. A positive charge near the top attracts negative charges, leaving positive charge at the other end of the metal rod, and the gold leaf is left with the same kind of charge. And of course, with the same kind of charge, the rod repels the gold leaf. When the wand is removed, the leaf falls back down, unless charge is transferred to the disc by physical contact. Float. Stay. Physical contact leaves the rod and gold leaf with a net excess charge and the leaf stays up. But it falls again at a touch of the hand. Down. The hand, which is itself a conductor, connects the post to the electroscope case. Where on earth did that extra charge go?
The electroscope case is in contact with the Earth, which is a very big conductor in its own right. When contact is made, the electroscope, like any other conductor, shares its charge, releasing most of it into the larger body. Although in reality only negative electrons flow from one place to another, the effect is exactly as if positive charge flowed in the opposite direction. This is called grounding an electric conductor, or simply grounding. And for all practical purposes, when it happens, the conductor becomes electrically neutral. Now that charge, even though it's a very small amount of charge, uh, this is much exaggerated, but that charge distributes itself uniformly ac across the Earth, okay? If this was just a regular ball and not the Earth itself, the charge would be sort of the same everywhere. Thank you. Okay. We're going to watch the full film when we finish this topic, but right now uh, we're just going to move on. So that's how the electroscope works. And I, I, I promise when we meet, I will do this. I, br I will bring in an electroscope and I will do these demonstrations for you. But now I'm going to skip over to So we've been talking about, uh, we mentioned here, uh, grounding. And in the film, you saw that the, the Earth is an enormous conductor. So if there's any connection to the Earth from a charged object, all the object will travel into the Earth itself. That's called grounding. When the wire is attached between the Earth and another conductor, any excess electrons will flow through the Earth, leaving the conductor neutral. This is called grounding. And of course, grounding, as a place in your home, you have what's called the grounding pin on an electrical connector and basically just a, a, a piece of metal that takes the, if any excess electricity builds up static electricity, it prevents that static electricity of accumulating here and heating this up or causing a little explosion or something. It basically takes the static electricity into the ground into the Earth's ground, as you saw there. Okay, so enough of grounding. There's some, some more grounding slides here, but we're not going to do that, because I usually just demonstrate th those things. But let's do some other problems. Look, let's do a uh, conceptual problem, where you don't have to do any calculations. I love those problems. Two charged objects with equal charge Q. So these are Q and Q here. They're all the same. So basically, uh, they're separated by distance R. All right, and, and and they attract each other with a certain force. If the charges on both objects are doubled, and the separation is half. Charges are doubled. Separation is half. What will the force be between the charges? There's no, there's no numerical calculation required, but it's good to do in this equation double Q, that would replace Q with 2Q, and half R here, replace R with half R, but don't forget to square each of those things. And see which of those you get. Come on, should be more people answering this. I'll, I'll get you started. Look, F prime, which is the new force now between them. And we're going to compare it to this one here. You are going to double Q. So it's, you're going to replace Q with what? 2Q. But this is squared. So this has. 
this has to be, want to do a different color, this has to be squared. And I'm going to replace R with half R. But don't forget, this is half R squared. How does this number, after you do the squaring, compare to that number? Is it bigger, smaller, or is how many times bigger, how many times smaller? Well, we still got to do the calculations. Let's do it. So this is two. Uh, no, two squared is four to be four k q squared on top on the numerator, right? Two squared is four q squared, four q squared times k. The bottom is going to be r over two squared. It means it's going to be r squared over four. How does this compare to this? I give you a hint. You got to multiply over here. You got to multiply this by four, numerator and denominator by four. So you, so you have. What happens then in the denominator? These cancel. And the numerator is that. How does that compare to that? Well, four times four is how much? 16, 16 what? KQ squared over R squared. So it's going to be 16 times greater. This was KQ squared over R squared. This is 16 times KQ squared over R squared. All right, so let's do sort of another conceptual one like that, and then we'll move on. An electric charge Q is placed in the origin. So here we have Q, that charge. It's at the origin. This is the origin right over here. Here's the charge. A charge, little Q, that's this one here, is placed at point B, right here it is. And the force on the charge. Q due to this one, they're going to call it F, right? Now, so the force is F. If the force is F when it's over here, what will the force be if we move it up to here? When Q is moved to location A, the force will be how many, how compared to F, how, what will it be here? Don't forget this comes from the fact that the force drops off as one over R squared. It means it gets smaller by one over R squared if you take it further away and bigger by one over R squared if you bring it closer. So what do you think is the right answer here? So basically what you're doing, you're halving the distance, right? It was here, now it's here. You're halving the distance. This was R. This is now going to be half R. But the force is going to be which one? Well, is it going to be bigger or smaller if you bring them closer together? Yeah, it's going to be bigger. So, you know, this is wrong, this is wrong, this is wrong. They're all bigger or the same. 
these two are bigger, so which one would it be? D or E? Still don't see many many answers here. If it drops off, if you, if you if you double the distance, the for the force will be one fourth. If you half the distance, this force will be four times as big. <laughs> okay. Okay, so now we're going to do some what called one dimensional problems. One dimensional problems. And then a bit later toward the end of class, we'll probably get to some two dimensional problems. But right now we're doing one dimensional problems. What does that mean? Well, we have a problem that where everything is along, uh, along a straight uh, horizontal line. So this is the position where our charges are. We're still work, working with charged bodies. So let's say we have We don't, oops. We don't need this right now. So we have two charged bodies. One is, uh, they're two meters apart. So each of these boxes is a meter, they're two meters apart. One is at the origin, and one is two meters away to, to the le to the left or to the right doesn't really matter. What is the force? This is six microcoulombs. This is minus four microcoulombs. What is the force on the on this of this charge and that charge? What is the force between them? Well, so here's the formula. This is not nothing nothing new. So Q one. K in this formula is equal to 9 times 10 to the minus 9. Q1 is 6 times 10 to the minus 6 coulombs. Q2 is 4 times 10 to the minus 6. Now, the fact that it's opposite, that means the forces are going to be in, in this direction. The force will be in this direction. Uh, this is 4 times 10 to the minus 6 divided by the distance between them squared, 2 meters squared. So if you do all this all this math, this will come out to be zero point zero five four. And the what are what are the units? Well, this is coulombs, coulombs. See, the coulombs, coulombs is coulomb squared. So this coulomb is going to cancel this coulombs. This is meters squared over here. This is going to be meters squared when you square the, the two. So this meter squared cancels that meter squared. So newtons, 0.054 newtons. Basic problem. Let's let's go one step beyond this. All right. So we're going to now look at the situations where you have. Uh, more than one charge here. First of all, let's outline generally how we will approach that. So for example, you can have three charges like I have here. Okay, and you're gonna be asked to find the total force on one charge. Let's say this one here, Q1. What's the total force on this charge due to these guys being on this line here? 
So first of all, you got to find out you have to draw a little vector to show what the force will be to each one. Will be this way or that way. You know, it's either this way or that way. So this is negative. This is positive. So the force will be this way. Due to this one. So we're doing this with red. This one here we're going to do with blue. Okay. So this is positive, this is positive, so the force will be this way. Now I haven't drawn these to scale yet, but I can really sort of approximate them. The net force on this would be the sum of these two vectors. This is a situation where the vectors are on the same line of action, so they're going to add or subtract. In this case, they're going to subtract. Okay, so we're going to give each of these a name. So the red one here, go back to red, is going to be called F on charge one by charge two. It's, it's going to be called F12. The force by charge one, on charge one, on this charge. B exerted by this charge. All right. The other one is blue, so we're going to write, put it over here. I'm going to call that force F13. F13 will be the force exerted by the charge 3 on charge 1. So this is F12, is the charge 2 inside uh, charge 1. And this is three on charge one, and we're gonna, and we're gonna be asked to find a net force acting on it. Now we can do the problem a little bit different. We could, we could say, okay, we want to find the force on this. Same thing on this, due to this charge and due to this charge. So we're calling this black. So first of all, let's figure out the force due to due to this, which we're going to call F12. Well, we already know what F12 is. This is going to be the same as over here, F12, except it's going to be in this direction. Because this is negative. Oh, I'm sorry. No, this is negative. This is positive. It's going to be in opposite direction. So this force will be also F12. F21, in this case, I'm sorry, 21. The force on charge 2 due to charge 1. How about charge 2 due to charge 3? Well, this, they're both opposite also, so they're going to be attracted. These are attracted, and these are attracted. So this force here due to this guy on this will be in this direction. And we're gonna call it F23. Now we're gonna repeat the same thing over here. So the, the, there'll be charge due to, to charge one. This is positive, this is positive. So that's gonna be repulsive. So the force due to charge one, I'm going to do it in black, is in this direction. I'm going to call it F31. And if, how about the charge two? Well, that's going to be, see, positive or negative. They're opposite charges, so they will attract. So that will be in this direction. I'm doing that in red, okay, red, red. And that's going to be F32. Okay, and all of these are going to be, you're going to have to use Coulomb's law just to figure out how long these arrows are. But that's a general approach. So assume all the charges other than the one in the 
with the, the initial force is being calculated are immobile. They're not moving. We're going to assume that. They're standing, somehow or other, they're standing still. Use, now, once we, we draw the arrows that we just did, okay, draw a free body diagram for each charge using the fact that opposite charge charges attract and like charges repel. And that's what we did. We did it for each charge, we drew the arrows. Then use Coulomb's law to find the magnitude. It means find how long those arrows are. Find out what F12 is, F13, etc., etc. Right? So we have F12. F12 is, is, is minus F21 because they're the same for each one. But there's three different forces here that you need to calculate. We're going to do a problem in a bit, but right now we're just sort of looking at how we're going to do such a problem. All right, so actually I did discuss that already. So, for example, we saw before that if you look at charge one, okay, these are the two forces on it. This one and this one exert. Right, we saw that before. Then we look at charge two. We look at the forces exerted this on this and this on this. And we found that also. And we do the same thing on charge three. So in on each charge, we can find the force due to the other two charges if we wanted to do that. And I'm just going to show you the calculations here so you can look at the film. You can sort of look at how they were gotten. It's too much calculating for us to do right now. But, you know, this is... a Somebody did the calculations here. Here they are. All right. So F12 is Q1 can Q, Q2 times the distance between them squared. Again, we, we're going to use these are meters over here. So the distance between them over here, the first two is eight meters. The Q1 and Q2, you put in the numbers over here that you had up here. Do the same thing for F13, F23. And you have all of these answers. Now, you can calculate, therefore, the, the net force on each one of these if you want. OK. So the, so the net force on charge Q1 is going to be this minus this. That's, and you find that here. On Q2, it will be this minus that. You find that here. And then, and then Q3 will be this minus that. I know that's a lot of work, so we're going to do something easier. But not a lot of work. Same type of problem, except we're going to get an answer here. Not a numerical answer, but, well, we'll see. What we're going to do is we have three charges, like we did before. The charge on this one, which we called before, we called Q1, was 6E. 6E means 6 times 1.6 times 10 minus 19. Six electrons. A six, I'm sorry, six protons. Six protons because it's positive. This one has three protons extra. And this one has five electrons extra of charge. So these are the charges. And we're going to calculate uh, which one am I we doing calculating here? Hold on a second. On charge two, all so we're not going to do all three charges. We're just going to do one charge. The force is exerted by this charge on charge two, and then by this charge on charge two. We're going to do one at a time. So one at a time means we're going to calculate. First of all, we're going to calculate F one on two. Okay, F one on on two. First of all, let's just draw it, draw it as an arrow. Now, these are uh, the same charge, so they repel one another. So the force on, on Q2 here will be like that. And this. And this will be the, the you're going to use Coulomb's law here. 
the answer to that is going to be K 6E times 3E divided by the distance between them, which is 6 squared. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. <coughs> This is not a bad calculation. It's, it's going to give you 6 times 3 is 18, so it's going to be k e squared divided by uh, 6 e squared six e squared divided by 36. Or I'm sure it's not six, guys. Don't let me make more mistakes here. Six times three is 18, right? Thank you. <laughs> All right. So 18 divided by 36 is one half. So it's one half ke squared. Now we're going to uh, find the force between these two. Uh, we're going to call that force F32. First of all, in what direction is the force on this one? Well, these are uh, opposite charge, so they will. So this will be attracted to this one. Okay, just to di differentiate it from the other one, I want to make it a different color. Uh, and this is F3, this is F32, this is F32, the red one is F32, the force between these two. And let's write the equation same way. Three E that's Q one multiplied by five E and we don't have to put in the minus sign here because we already took that into account when we decided that the force is going to be this way. All right. Divided by the distance between them, and the distance between them is one to three meters, three squared. So three times five is 15 E squared divided by nine. And this 15 divided by nine is 1.6. So this is 1.6 K E squared. And the question here is, compute the net force exerted on the middle charge by the other two charges. So the net force means, what do you got to do with this? You got to add them up. Well, that's not too bad because what you're adding up is, this is 0 0.5 Ke squared, K e squared and this is 1.6 you add them up you get 2.1 k e squared uh, I messed up this joint two point one Messed it up again. Messed it up with two here. Two point one k e squared. Now, if you wanted a number for this, you could put in the numbers, but you don't have to. You could just leave it like that. You 
put it for K, what it is, E, don't forget what is E, it's a charge of an electron or a proton. Okay, <clears throat> that's why these were uh, given in terms of E. All right, let me see if any comments. Well, if the forces are not in opposite direction on, on this one. They're in the same direction because uh, this force here is due to this one. It, it's a tr They're attractive. And this force here is due to this one. It's repulsive. They're both in the same direction. That's why you add them. Now, if one of them happened to be in the other direction, then you would subtract them, yes. Okay. Any other questions on this? So this uh, little simple problem has everything that we that we can possibly have in a, in a problem like this. All right. There's one more problem here that I could outline. Let me see. This is very similar, except in this case, you just, you're going to have to do some calculations. Uh, you know, I'm not going to do this right now. Maybe, maybe this is a pro We'll come back to this problem probably in recitation on, the, on Monday. Hey, you know, guys, we meet actually, you get to meet each other on Monday. So I'm looking forward to that. Uh, but now we have, we didn't take a break. So, you know, I'm going to just keep going. I'm on, I guess I'm on a roll. I got a, I know I had a tough start with a couple of mistakes, but now I seem to be in a roll, right? So I might as well keep going and we'll end up somewhat earlier uh, and not take a break. I, I think when, once we meet in person, I'm going to have to take a break, but I think teaching from home is easier. So what we're going to do now is we're going to consider what's called two-dimensional problems. First of all, let's sort of outline what is a two-dimensional problem. Well, it's a problem where all the charges are not on a straight line. All right. Before the in the problems we did, the charges were distributed along a straight line. That would be called that a one dimensional problem. But how, what if they're not? If they're, for example, like this. And you want to do the same thing find the force, same thing we just did, find the force on one of them exerted by the other two. Well, this is why we had to do vectors in the math review. So, for example, I'll just give you some examples. The way this is going to proceed is going to be this way. We're going to have some number of, of, of charges, and this they could be positive or negative. In this example, they're all negative. They're all positive, I'm sorry. And we're going to find the net force on uh, on this charge due to the other three. The other three are all pushing it away because they're all positive. So each one is going to, one is going to exert a force this way, one is going to exert a force this way. And the third one is going to exert a force that way. Three vectors, and you got to add them up. Okay, so basically, just conceptually, they look like this. The three vectors, here they are, the three vectors. Here they are added up, this one vector. How do you add three vectors? Well, we, we sort of outline how to do that. And it's not as bad as you may think. It's not as bad as you may think. But again, these charges don't all have to be the same. And they all don't have to be, well, they're going to be the same for a while, but they all don't have to be positive or, or have to, some could be negative, right? Then these directions of these forces would be different. So 
So this brings us a little, a little bit of review. How, how do you add vectors? Well, first of all, you use trigonometry, sine, cosine, and tangent. And you say you had two vectors. We know the tip to tail method of adding two vectors is this. Put one, the tail of one on the tip of the other, and this is the resultant vector. And that resultant vector has components, which you can read from here, what they are, they come out really nicely. This is two, this is uh, about 10 over here. But we're not gonna do it that way. We just know it could be done that way. What we're gonna do is resolve these into components. We're gonna replace this vector by its X component, which is that. And the X component here is going to be B sine of this angle. And it's Y component. And the Y component is going to be, I'm sorry, this is sine of this angle. And this is the cosine of this angle over here. I'm just generally uh, looking how how, you, how we're going to do that, but the problems we're going to do is going to are going to work out not as not as hard as as you think. Now we're going to do the same thing on this side. We're going to replace this vector with its components. Uh, so the x component is a cosine of this angle. And these angles could be the same or they could be different. Now, once we replace these two vectors, that means we could take them away. They're gone. And now what we're going to do is going to add or subtract just these two. So these two are up, so they're going to add up to that. These two are in opposite directions, so basically we subtract them and they're going to add up to that. Hey, you know what? They add up to exactly the components of this vector over here. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine here, and two here. So this, this vector now, which is the resultant, this has this distance is two, this distance is nine. We can calculate now this angle here. Uh, sorry, this this the, the hypotenuse here. R squared. We're not gonna do it, I'm just saying it could be done. R squared equals two squared plus nine squared. And this angle here. The, the, the angle that the, that the vector makes is going to be the tangent that we use the tangent to find that angle. Okay, so this is generally how you, how these things could be done. Uh, things are not going to be as bad as, as much work as you think there are, right? But we sort of got the idea what we're going to do. So for example, let's say you have three charges like this. Again, we're not going to calculate it, but just, just to use it as an example. And we want to find the, the net force on these on this charge here due to these other ones. So first of all, this is negative, this is positive. The force is this way. This is F2 on three. These two charges, they're both positive, so they repel one another. So the force will be that way. So what we will need to do, we're going to need to calculate what these things are, calculate the magnitude of the force using Coulomb's law, the magnitude of this force using Coulomb's law. Then we're going to need to find the components of this force. These two components subtract out, and this, there is no other component, so this is the, the Y component of the net force. The net force is going to be somewhere in the middle here, depending on how big these arrows here are, these two arrows.
So let's do something like that. So here we have three charges. This is called Q3. It's eight microcoulombs. This is called Q1. It's six microcoulombs. And this is called Q2. It's four microcoulombs. And the, our mission is this. What force, what is the force on this four microcoulomb charge? This one here. First of all, let's just draw the vectors. So we got to draw two vectors on this on this charge to show in which direction the force is. So this this is minus it's minus four coulombs. This is plus eight uh, microcoulombs. So the force will be attractive between them. No, this is, I'm sorry, this is, this is negative. Let me move this here. This is negative. All right. So the force will be, uh, this is negative. So the force will be repulsive. So there will be a force down like this. Okay, because these repel one another. Of course, a little more. Okay, so this is what we call F, uh, F23. This is force F23. Be the force between these two. This is going to be called, do you do this one? This is negative, this is positive. So the force will be in this direction. Let me make it a little shorter. I don't know, right, right now, I don't know the magnitudes of these. In this direction. And therefore, the net force is going to be the sum of these two. It's going to be somewhere. I, I just draw this randomly before, so it'd be something like this. Okay. All right. Let's let's sort of go back because we're going to calculate. First of all, we got to calculate how long these arrows are. All right. Uh, this one here, we're going to call F12. F charge one on charge two All right so we have two forces to add so what we got to do is we got to find the components of this force this one's good you don't need to do anything with it all we need to do is find how long this arrow is and of course to find that you're going to use coulomb's law right over here so we're going to use this two times one to find this and the other time to find this. So let's do the calculations. F one two is equal to going to use in this equation and use these two charges here. Uh, one, uh, we're going to do F1, 2 first. So we're doing these two charges here. Okay, F1, 2, these two charges here. So K, 9 times 10 to the minus 9. That's K times Q1, which is uh, which is this is one here six microcoulombs. I'm just going to put six for the time being, and this one is four microcoulombs, and these are going to be multiplied by ten to the minus 
six or 10 to the minus 12. Divided by the distance, the, the distance between them here everywhere, this is two meters, this is three meters. So it'll be two squared. All right, just I know this is a pain in the ass calculation, but I, so I did it for you. Here it is, 0.036 F12. Now we're going to do again one more time. We got to do this to calculate F323. That's the length of this arrow here. No, I'm sorry, uh, two three. This arrow, this arrow here. Two three. Right between these two. So what we need, first of all, we need to know what this distance is. Well, if this is two, and this is one, two, three. This is three. So the distance here. I'll do it in green. This distance here. It's called R. That's still going to be the R in this equation. But what is R? This is between them. Well, this squared plus this squared equals this squared. Yeah, I know. We use everything we know in math, right? All the math we have. We're going to use it here. So R squared is equal to 13, and therefore R is going to equal the square root of 13. Actually, we don't need to calculate R, because we're going to use R squared, right? We have R squared here. All right, good. Forget about R. So we're going to use this formula, and now R squared here is going to be 13. If I didn't make a mistake. I, I did make a mistake, but that's a, it's a drawing mistake because the problem is simpler. This is supposed to be, I drew this too far up. This, this should have been over here. Okay. This should have been over here. So this distance is 2 also. So r squared is equal to 2 squared plus 2 squared is equal to 8. Okay, this squared plus that squared equals r squared. Makes it a little simpler. All right. So let's just now uh, write the equation here. So it's going to be the same thing over here, 9 times 10 to minus 9th. Multiplied by, now we're going to be multiplying by 4 times 8. 4 microcoulombs times eight microcoulombs. Divided by eight R squared, which is eight. And again, this is 10 to the minus six times 10 to the minus six. It's supposed to be 12 here. Uh, yeah, I did the calculation for you. It's 0.054. So basically, we've come to the conclusion that this vector F12 is 0.036. Let me make it a little smaller here. And this vector here is 
0 0.054. So what do I have to do now? Well, now this vector is set. We don't have to do anything here. But this vector here, we have to find the components of this vector. We have to find the y component, close F two three y, and we have to find the x component. To find these components, we have to know what this angle here is, because that's pretty easy to figure out if you look over here. This angle, because these two sides are the same, this angle is 45 degrees. Okay, this angle is 45 degrees. So, you calculate, that means uh, the cosine and sine are going to be the same if it's 45 degrees. Save us some calculations here. <clears throat> Uh, so the first thing we do is we find out that uh, F F two X is going to equal to Point oh five zero point oh five four cosine of forty five and F two Y It's going to equal to, well, it's going to be equal to the same thing, right? Because this is 45 degrees. And what it's equal to is going to be, both of these are equal to a zero point oh two five. Uh, 0 0.038, I'm sorry, 038. So, to find the, the, uh, the, the total angle, okay, uh, the, the total, I'm sorry, vector in the x direction, or x, This is 0 0.036, this is 0 0.38. So it's gonna be the difference between those two. I seem to have 0 0.025 here. Well, let me just put down the answers. Fx is equal to, z by adding those up, is 0 0.013. And Ry, the total Ry is going to equal to 0 0.038. Okay, this is. And basically, that's how it's done. I know, I know. So you can watch, there's a video of this program, 
on Facebook of, of a guy doing all the calculations just like I did painfully. But it, it, it's a it's a big you, you, it's a big undertaking and basically. I mean, in a test, I wouldn't expect you to do all of this. Obviously, it'd take you an hour. But basically, conceptually, to be able to do that. Now, we're, we're going to apply it to a couple of simple situations. Okay? Problems where, where you're going to simplify. They're not going to be this complicated in terms of calculations because they're going to have what's called symmetry. So let's let's look at those problems. So let's take a look at this. Let's assume we have three charges and let's, we're going to choose the charges to be exactly the same q q q they're on on the corners of an equilateral triangle so the, each distance is r what we want to do is want to want to calculate the net force on this charge charge c due to the other charges a and b First of all, let's just draw it. In order to draw it, we're going to put in a coordinate system right here at the charge. Okay. So there's a coordinate system there because these are going to be vectors. We're going to have to look at them. But right now, let us let us uh, just draw the vectors. All right. So these two, all, all these charges are are, are uh, the same. So they're all going to be repulsive. So these two are going to repulse. In other words, the force due to those two is going to be like this. This is A on C. The force due to those two here, here is going to be like this. This is B on C. If all these charges are the same, what they are, it means these are exactly the same. And that means the x component here and the x component here are going to cancel each other out. This is going to be the same as that. And the y component here and the y component here is going to be exactly the same. So to solve this problem, all we got to do is calculate this y component, period. And I'm done. And double it, because don't forget, there's two vectors here. So let me show you this in a little needed diagram. OK. So we have uh, FAC, FBC, and You're going to break them up into components. Well, before we do that, let's, there's, there's something we can answer right now about this problem. So I'm going to post the problem, see if you can get it. So this is the problem. We have this exact configuration. This is the question. Three positive charges equal charge Q are located in the corners of an equilateral triangle. Side R. What is the direction of the net force? on charge C due to charges A and B. Is the net force here going to be like this? Or is it 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 going to be like this? I'm going to give you a hint. I'm going to go back to this. Matter of fact, go back to this. Okay. These two vectors, the x components, because these, these charges are all the same, that means these two lengths are the same. These two components are the same. They cancel each other out. Cancel each other out means what? You can erase them. Therefore, 
all that's left is the upward component. So these two are going to add up to what type of vector? Let me move this here. And we're going to add that on to here. So they're going to add up to this vector here. When all is said and done. OK. Can you answer the question now? Okay, it's a conceptual question. You don't have to calculate anything. You just have to say in which direction is the net force on this one due to these other two. Is it here, 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 here? One more time the hint. Here's the hint. Okay, let's see if you guys are getting it right. Yes. Okay, finally. I have to give it a super hint, right? Yeah, this one, a B is the right answer. Because the X components canceled off, right? Therefore, only the Y components were left. And therefore, the net force is going to be straight up. The next question is going to be a little harder. Not as bad as the previous problem that we did, but it's going to be a little harder. Next question is going to be, well, it's okay, so it's up. But what is it? Multiple choice. I obviously I don't expect you to answer this question now by looking at these numbers. All right. But one of these choices is, and the hint is that when we're going to do calculations, you remember that well, first of all, this angle here is going to be 60 degrees. And we're going to, at some point, use the sine of 60. And the 60 degrees is one of the special angles. That means it could be, it has, the, the sine of 60 degrees can be written with square root of 3 over 2. We're going to need to use that. So we'll do this. This will be our last problem. And I, I got it, I got it split up pretty much, you know, pretty much, uh, much separately in each slide, bit, bit by bit. It's not that bad as you think. All right. So again, this is what we're going to do. We got the, we got the two. We know this is what it's going to look like. We know that the two x components cancel each other out. So all we got to do is find the Y component and double it because it's here, here, and they're the same. All we got to do is find this, okay? And we know this angle here is 60 degrees. And we can figure out what this is here, the length of this, of this vector, because this is going to be what we call FAC. I don't want to show you all the answers there. We'll, we'll lead you to the answers. So, again, this is FAC. This is FBC. We already answered that. We know that the x components are going to cancel so we know that the net result is going to be straight up okay but we know that straight up means this here plus that there so we all have to do is calculate this 
and I'm going to I'm going to show it to you bit by bit over here. So the the y component of the resultant, right? The, this here is going to be f a c y plus f b c y. So all we got to do is calculate one of these and just because this is going to be exactly the same. Just double it, all right? So what's the y component? It's going to be f a c. Don't forget f a c is the length of this vector. times the cosine of 60. But the cosine of 60 is what? Square root of 3 over 2. Uh, and there was a hint on this. What was the hint? Oh, yeah. Square root of 3 over 2. Uh, it's the sine of 60. I'm sorry. It's the square root of, square root of 3 over 2. All right. So this is the square root of 3 over 2. So all we got to do is calculate, use Coulomb's law to calculate this, and then multiply by the square root of 3 over 2. All right, so let's calculate it. FAC is, right, FAC square root of 3 over 2. It's the same thing over there. We're just going to do it once and then just double it. Okay, so all we got to do, we got over here, we're going to call FAC and FBC just F. You know, for these ACs and BCs, we're going to call it F. Okay, and how do you get F? Well, Coulomb's law. KQQ over R squared, or KQ squared over R squared, right? And this is the square root of 3 over 2 over here. I think you missed out the 2 here. All right. So. I have it over here. Square root of three divided by two. That's it. That's the answer. You when you double this, right? That's why you lose the the two here. Could get square root of two, uh, f y is equal to uh, f the square root of three over two. F here is just k q q over r k q squared over r squared, and this becomes just one half plus one half is one whole. That's what they get it, okay. There's one hole. And that's the answer. So let's go back to the choices. All right. I'm I'm gonna come back to this if I need to, but because now you should tell me what is the correct answer. Let me go back to this. Here's the correct answer. Uh, let me move this a little bit.
That's the correct answer. All right. Now, this was the hint that we used, okay? So when we got when we got to this point here, it, F, F is just KQ squared over R squared. Right, that's what F is over here. And basically to get F, you needed to multiply this by the sine of 60 degrees. This, is, this was what it was. By the sine of 60 degrees. Uh, and that means it's this times the square root of 3 over 2. But there's two of them. There's one over here, and there's another one exactly the same over here. So there's another kq squared over r squared, square root of 3 over 2. And that adds up to 1 half plus 1 half is 1 whole. You get square root of 3, no, no 2 here anymore, kq squared over r squared. Okay, so we're going to end the class on this. On Tuesday, on Monday, I'm sorry, we will do, we're going to do more problems on this. We're not going to cover new material. We're just going to do more problems. This And there will be a pop quiz related to everything we did today. Uh, let me, first of all, stop recording. So you, if you want to, you can look 